Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. This is a special edition podcast. It's the morning after President Biden's State of the Union speech, and we have PRI's panel of former speechwriters to offer their perspective on, on this first State of the Union by President Biden. So we have Lance Izumi, who is a former speechwriter to Governor Duke Majin and a former speechwriter to Attorney General Ed Meese. Lance is now PRI Senior Director of the Center for Education. We also have Tim and I, a speechwriter to former Governor Arnold Schultz. Schwarzenegger and speechwriter to Kevin McCarthy when he was at the California Assembly. Tim is now our Senior Director of Communications at PRI, and I'm Rowena Ichon, Senior Vice President, and I was Governor Pete Wilson's speechwriter and was also a research assistant in President Reagan's speechwriting staff. So, Tim and Lance, I don't usually go first, but I have to say I will go first this time. I was shocked and awed by how bad this speech was. This was Biden's moment to rescue his presidency, and he completely squandered that opportunity. It's nothing short of political malpractice on the part of his staff and his speechwriters. It was just a lot of blather, State of the Union usual boilerplate blather with a little Ukraine tapped on in the beginning. It was just a terrible, terrible speech. When it comes to uh, addressing Ukraine, it could have been his tear down this wall moment. He could have, Biden could have said directly to Putin, uh, Mr. Putin, turn back your forces, stop this war now. There was no eloquence. Just got the feeling that he was just reading this stuff from his speechwriters. It was just pathetic. Again, he was he was leading from behind, talked a lot about, quote, the collective power of our allies, opening the strategic reserves, um, releasing 30 million barrels. We know that didn't work last time. Uh, the U.S. consumes 20 million barrels, so that's only a day and a half of oil. And he talked about something about, you know, not allowing Russian planes flying over the U.S. Now, what, what is that going to do? And then, of course, he discussed the sanctions. But, you know, when he when he delivered these points, he sort of ripped through them like he was talking about a, like, like a grocery shopping list. The, the speech was very, very bad. I don't know what happened to his speechwriters. Again, this was their moment to shine. They could have risen to the occasion and helped try to rescue his presidency. But who knows? Maybe they're all distracted looking for jobs by now. We all know about the famous Charles Dickens book, A Tale of Two Cities. Well, I think last night was A Tale of Two Speeches. And in my mind, those chapters would be titled Bad and Worse. I think that the opening part on Ukraine, I will be a little more charitable. I thought it was clearly the best part of the Biden speech, and it was his strongest delivery of the night, albeit we have a very low bar to clear on on that front. On paper, there were some of those lines that you would expect from an American president You know, we have the unwavering resolve that freedom will always triumph over tyranny. You know, tonight I say no more. You know, every single inch, we're send an unmistakable symbol to the world. As Rose said, there wasn't that rallying of uh, the world, rallying, um, you know, that clarion American call that only an American president can deliver was, was really missing. Now, I will say it was a tremendous visual to have the Ukraine ambassador next to the first lady and being hugged by the first lady. It was perhaps the moment uh, of the night. And, you know, it's kind of what the world was looking for, but it wasn't nearly as effective or powerful as it could have been because of his stumbling, poor delivery. And as you say, Ro, that kind of, you know, racing through these words. The line I remember most from that portion of the speech was, but I want you to know that we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. What speechwriter would write something like that? Well, they have this jazz that Biden is the great empathizer. Well, this isn't a time for empathy. This is a time to show strength. We're not responding to a natural disaster. That did not to use Gavin Newsom's overused phrase, that did not meet the moment. I thought a real failing, too, in that opening section, he trampled over what should have been his most effective line 
where he said, we'll never, you know, trample over the spirit of the Iranian people when he clearly <laughs> meant the Ukrainian people. I mean, my God, if I, you know, I- I'm sure you've all had this moment when you, uh, the principle that you're writing for flubs something, and I'm sure it's a constant occurrence for the Biden speechwriters. Oh, I'd be going nuts in the back of the room hearing that. He really missed the opportunity to make the case for why this fight and some of the sacrifices that we're enduring, like higher gas prices, are important for Americans and the cause of freedom. And I think the State of the Union is a time where you can make that case and you can rally the American people. And I thought um, that was really a missed opportunity on his part, too. I just want to add one to your point, Tim is uh, I was watching CNN because I like to watch um, uh, different coverage of the speech. And they had they took a poll of the viewers of this of the speech. And most of them were ready to sacrifice the gas prices and energy and and take on higher costs to stop buying gas from Russia so that Putin can't can't feed the uh, his his war machine against Ukraine, the, the American people were already ready for that. Go ahead, Lance. Yeah, well, you know, I, I agree with that, Ro. I, I, I think that one of the things with uh, that CNN poll was not just with uh, that issue of gas prices and uh, is the fact that overall that CNN poll came out, you know, pretty poorly for um, uh, for Biden. And in fact, uh, CNN's talking heads were all pretty morose about the fact that even amongst their viewers, whoever they were sampling, you know, that they were giving Biden, you know, very lukewarm and tepid uh, marks for his speech. And if a CNN audience is giving you that, then you know that the country is not convinced. My overall view of this speech is that it was perhaps, I mean, beyond the delivery and all that kind of stuff. Yes, he did make some verbal flubs and all that. But beyond that, you know, it was the most disingenuous speech I have ever heard in my life. I mean, you just go down point by point by point, area by area and area, and you see nothing but disingenuousness on the part of Joe Biden and uh, his speechwriters. I mean, the Ukraine part, I mean, he's basically doing this victory dance about saying how he's uh, pulling together the NATO allies and we're more unified than ever and all of this sort of thing. And it's, I'm thinking to myself, wait a second, you know, you told Zelensky to uh, get out of, um, uh, out of uh, Kiev and Zelensky replies, I don't need a ride. I need ammunition. And where was that ammunition that should have been going to uh, the Ukrainians before the Russian intervention, before the Russian invasion? Uh, it wasn't to be seen. Now Biden, you know, sends $350 million of uh, defense aid belatedly to the Ukrainians. Well, how is that going to get in? And how is that now going to be any kind of deterrent to the Russians to prevent an invasion when they've already invaded? I mean, it's just like uh, uh, what happened in Afghanistan. It's a continuation of this debacle of defense and foreign policy that we've seen. And, um, you know, when Zelensky you know, there was an interview with him that they aired uh, last night, actually, where, you know, he says that I've had many calls with President Biden and he hasn't listened, you know, and he, he thanked President Biden, but he said that he, ha- he hasn't listened. And I think that says oodles. You can, you know, hug the Ukrainian ambassador, but if you're not helping the people of Ukraine actually defend their country, you know, ahead of time to prevent this Russian invasion, and then you take a victory dance. I just think that that is a height, that's an insult, and in addition to being disingenuous. Uh, The other points, too, that you go down the list, I mean, on the economy, he didn't get to inflation until maybe halfway through his uh, talk on the economy. He, again, did a victory dance about how You know, there was job growth in the country and things were humming along. And, yeah, you know, he said we have uh, inflation. But then, you know, his uh, his solutions were virtually non-existent. He basically told uh, uh, producers to simply cut prices or control their prices, you know, or cut costs. Well, how was he going to do anything to help those things happen, you know, (laughs) And then, you know, he then says that we need secure borders. Well, he's had the most porous borders 
of any president in the history of the United States. And now he's talking about secure borders. And then he says that we're supposed to, uh, you know, that he's always been for funding the police. Well, that is absolute lie. We all know that uh, he and his party were very much in favor of defunding the police. And also, too, even if they now have done a turnaround and somehow favor funding the police, they, he said nothing about how to uh, uh, rein in the liberal prosecutors like those uh, the, like um, Chester Bourdain in uh, San Francisco or uh, George Gascon in Los Angeles, who are the ones who are, you know, regardless of how much you're funding the police, whether they are the ones who are letting criminals out, you know, before they're, uh, you know, and, and, and loose and not prosecuting them. There was nothing about that. And so I just thought from start to finish, this was a disingenuous speech. And I think the American people saw it for what it was. Lance, it's uh, sad to know you don't have any strong opinions on this speech. <laughs> well, you know, you asked me to watch the speech and I did. <laughs> uh, we, we were, once again, I made Lance endure the State of the Union address. Let's go through some of the key highlights of the speech. Let's start with COVID-19. Um, you know, it was pretty clear right from the start that the Democrats were intent on declaring victory on COVID. In fact, that's why the speech, which usually happens, you know, maybe the last week of January or the first week of February, was delayed until March 1st because they were hoping that they would be beyond uh, Omicron. So how do you think what the president said about COVID-19 and where we're at and what the administration is proposing fared. Ro, what did you think? Well, to your point, Tim, again, that I guess the science said that it's now okay to remove the mask right before the State of the Union. How about that? As far as COVID, you know, Biden's approval ratings were highest when it came to COVID. But since they had prolonged the, the school closures, business closures, um, mask mandates, his approval ratings when it comes to handling COVID just dropped like a rock. And I think this was his uh, moment to say, well, we've transitioned, we're moving from um, pandemic to endemic, continue to be careful. There could be other variants along the way. We don't know. Working with Pfizer for new treatments. He had that program about uh, test and treat, something like that, where you could, if, if you test positive for COVID, uh, you could get um, treatment right away. I'm a little skeptical about this. I mean, I don't know if I test for uh, COVID, I would want to take a pill on the spot. I'd rather discuss it with my doctor. I, I think that was kind of a, a foolish idea. I don't, I'd like to see my own doctor and get a full assessment of exactly what I have and whether I do need, you know, some kind of special pill. The administration and progressives mishandling of the whole COVID era during his watch. And uh, he's probably just happy to put it to bed. Lance, I'm sure you have something to say about what Biden <laughs> said about COVID. <laughs> Well, you know something, uh, I'm not going to, to echo some of the things that uh, Rose said. You know, I mean, I think that he's trying to, you know, smooth out things, you know, uh, and kind of make people forget about, you know, what's happened over, you know, his tenure. And, you know, the, uh, uh, he, he wants to, you know, go back to some kind of normalcy when, you know, we could have gotten back to that a lot sooner. I mean, you look at, you know, a number of the uh, red states that did go back to a more normal situation and they fared just fine. And, you know, Biden and his administration, you know, were the ones who were dragging their feet. I mean, the evidence has been there. I mean, you look at the uh, study that just came out by Johns Hopkins uh, that showed that the lockdowns were basically a failure, that they didn't, you know, improve uh, overall health. They certainly uh, hurt the economy. And so, you know, all of this uh, suffering that the American people went through was really for nothing. And then uh, you look at, for example, something specific like the mask mandates. Uh, you know, even in uh, publications like The Atlantic, there, you know, you had a great article just a few weeks ago showing how the science has never supported mask mandates in schools for kids and that um, even the CDC's uh, evidence, so-called, that they put out there has been just rife with uh, methodological flaws in the data and in the uh, studies that they've put out and that really the, the rigorous data that is available from around 
not just the country, but from a, around the world, have shown that the mass mandates in schools really don't do anything. And in fact, there are some studies, for example, a study, I believe, uh, up in North Dakota that showed that, you know, uh, school districts that imposed mass mandates actually had more COVID cases than uh, districts that had optional uh mask uh, policies. So, you know, I, I, I just think that this is, again, too little, too late for uh, Biden. I think the country is just fed up with things. And, uh, you know, him trying to now say that we're going back to normalcy, you know, regardless of what the CDC now is, is saying, I think it's just too late for him. That's right, Lance. And, and um, recall that uh, three school board members uh, were recalled in San Francisco. So I think there's a fear among progressives that they too could lose their jobs. And that's why Biden was trying to just smooth this over and move on. Well, and Lance, you're 100 percent right. You know, he, he talks about cheering being massless in the classroom and people. Isn't it great? People are returning to work in person. But his policies dragged it out longer than needed. And his allies are the ones that blocked it from happening for far too long. The key thing that I thought about when listening to all of his COVID talk was we have all these things that are free or no cost. Well, who's going to pay for that? How are we going to lower the deficit at the same time we're handing out all of these free things? I thought Ari Fleischer had a great tweet last night where he said, you know, Biden really shouldn't brag about providing free COVID tests. He didn't have them ready when we needed them in December. People forget, you know, just a few months ago, the scramble to get tested. Then he had the government buy up all the supplies on the market. That's why you couldn't get them at Amazon or in your local stores. And then he sent them after it was too late. It was really a dismal failure. And that's what happens when, you know, government is the one in charge of handing out all the free uh, and, things. And Tim, he's sending more out. Can you believe that? <laughs> yes, you can get some more. Uh, <laughs> I've got about a dozen stashed in, in my house. I don't really know what I'm going to do with them. <laughs> well, make sure you take them before the expiration date. Otherwise, <laughs> you know, we'll have them for... Uh, We'll have them for nothing. So on that kind of uh, everybody talking about, you know, Biden talking about free things, let's talk about the economy, which obviously was a a big topic and Americans were looking for what he would say about uh, inflation and, you know, the declining stock market and economic jitters. Lance, what did you uh, think of what uh, the president had to say about his economic plans? Well, you know, again, you know, getting back to my original theme of disingenuousness, I mean, you know, he led off, you know, his uh, section on the economy by pointing to the fact that he's there's been supposedly job growth in um, in the economy, that, the, that he's had uh, low unemployment. You know, you know, the, the, the afterwards during the commentary I watched on Fox, for example, there was certainly a lot of um, uh, argument against some of the numbers that he was pushing forward, whether they were true or not. But even beyond that, you know, uh, is that if you, you know, he's taking credit for whatever good there is in the economy, when actually, I thought this is, uh, and you, I'm sure we'll get to Kim Reynolds, the Republican response in a little bit, but uh, I thought uh, Kim Reynolds made a really good point when she said that if you look at unemployment, for example, which Biden claimed to, uh, you know, be um, you know, a big champion of uh, low unemployment, that actually out of the 20 states that have had low unemployment and, be- and better job growth in the country during COVID, 17 out of those 20s are Republican states, states with Republican governors. And so, you know, I think that Biden is taking credit for something that, you know, really may really be uh, uh, the uh, achievement at a more local level, at the state and uh, level, you know, of the Republicans. And so, Again, I thought that was a, you know, a sign of disingenuousness, but also, too, you know, I, the one thing that stuck out in my mind uh, about the economy was when he said that, you know, one of the reasons why we need to um, uh, how, how to deal with inflation was to you know, deal with some of this, uh, 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 these monopolies or co- uh, corporate structures. And he said that, for example, uh, with regard to the food prices, he was talking about how there were only four meat packing plants in the Midwest that were processing all the meat. And because of that, you know, that was somehow, you know, uh, responsible for higher uh, meat prices, or certainly higher food prices. And I just thought to myself, well, 
okay, even if that's true, that there are only four meatpacking plants in the Midwest that are doing all this processing, well, they were certainly, uh, that was certainly the case during Donald Trump's administration, and we didn't have uh, inflation during that time. So how is it the fact that there are only these four meatpacking plants in the country that are causing, you know, higher, let's say, beef or pork prices, you know? Um, how come it all of a sudden became an issue when Joe Biden became president? And obviously it's not. It's just a red herring. And uh, you know he has no plan. You listen to what he uh, was talking about in terms of uh, trying to uh, reduce inflation. And it was just laughable. Absolutely laughable. He said that, you know, the, uh, companies need to cut costs and, and raise wages. I mean, that's his solution to inflation. I mean, again, it's just uh, 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 evidence that this is a fundamentally unserious administration. Bro, what say you? Well, you know, in terms of inflation, I don't think the Biden administration knows what to do about it. And they've just they've simply outsourced it to the Fed and are hoping for the best. I mean, his uh his solutions were, were goofy. He reiterated some of the proposals from the old Build Back Better program that, that failed in Congress. You know, so his, his idea is to, to subsidize families, Americans, for the higher costs they're, they're facing with inflation, which would mean he wants to you know, help with child care and help with you know, this and help with that, infuse the economy with even more money and driving inflation higher. I don't think the administration knows what to do at all. And again, just leaving it to the Fed and hoping that at some point inflation will start to fall. I agree with you, Lance, in terms of the a job creation. You know, these, these are not jobs that were created because of a, a vibrant economy, which is what you can brag about. These jobs went away because of COVID and they came back. So of course, you're going to see a lot of job growth and they didn't come back as hard as we're still hoping for. I agree with everything uh, you both said. You know, I thought his talk of the economy, it, it, you know, it, it seemed like a plan someone who was in the Senate for 36 years would put out. You know, it was just a laundry list of old, tired ideas from the Ted Kennedy era that failed and have never succeeded. You know, it was it was the Christmas tree of liberal big spending. You know, I I really thought it it was laughable when, when he was talking about, you know, inflation, when his policies are the ones. That are, that are making it all worse. I'm, Charles C.W. Cook from National Review said it best on Twitter last night. He said, you know, I must say I enjoy Biden's commitment to surrealism. He complained about inflation, then immediately touted a bill that made it much worse. Then he moved on to let's make things in America before listing a whole ser- series of ideas that make that considerably less likely. You know, he says he has this plan to cut inflation, but what is that plan? Well, A, he talks about we're going to have all government price controls on prescription drugs. Well, we know that price controls drive up co- prices and we'll have less available supply. He says, let's let government negotiate price of prescription drugs. That'll mean less access and higher costs and government bureaucrats determining what drugs will be available. Let's cut energy costs by combating climate change, as we've seen from our Wayne Wine Garden's work. In, here in California, government energy mandates are driving up energy costs for working Californians. Let's pass the PRO Act, which would take away opportunities for poor and minority entrepreneurs to start a business and hire workers and work their way up the economic ladder. So it was really just laughable, everything that um, that he had to say on the economy. And you're right, Ro, they have no plan. They have no idea. It just is the old Democrat um, wish list that is discredited and doesn't work and was rejected as recently as December when Senator Manchin said he wasn't going for for build back better. Um, Let's look at the we like this part where we can geek out about how the speech was written and how the speech was delivered. So what did you think of the speech uh, as written and then as delivered, Roe? 
Well, I think I said before earlier that I thought this speech was poorly written. Seems like the speechwriters didn't really care. They they wrote the usual laundry list, um, State of the Union wish list that uh, we are uh, all familiar with. And then they tacked on a little message on Ukraine, kind of said, okay, done, we're, we're finished. This would have been their moment. They should have been um, rising to the occasion. They should have written him a better speech and, and they should have uh, made allowances for President Biden's, you know, it's terrible speech giving style. I mean, he really is a terrible speaker, but you know, that's okay. Not every, you know, this is not his gift as a politician. So at, at a minimum, they should have made the speech much, much shorter. Uh, it was a little over an hour long. Let's face it, the president just doesn't really have the stamina to get, get through a speech. Probably all he needed was maybe a half hour speech instead of this laundry list of, of stuff and, uh, and made some key points on Ukraine and the economy and, and, and COVID perhaps. That's probably all he he really needed. I don't know where the speechwriters are these days. It's 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 sad, and and they, you know, he needs to be getting some fresh writers. Lance, it was pretty clear that this speech was um, written a long time ago, and you know, at least the laundry list part, and it was very much written by committees. So every you know bureaucrat from every department got their tick off of their item included in the speech. Can you give a little peek behind the scenes? What is it like when you have to write a speech like this where so many sets of eyes have their input into the speech and why a speech writers loathe speeches written by committee? No, that's 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 right, Tim. Uh, it and I think Ro kind of alluded to this too in, in her uh, evaluation. I mean, when you cut, there's a difference between uh, the types of speeches that uh, politicians give and therefore the types of speeches that speechwriters have to write. I mean, there are the ordinary speeches that, uh, you know, all three of us have written where, you know, our, um, you know, our political master, you know, is going to be making a speech to, you know, the Chamber of Commerce or, you know, to a school group or something like that. And so you write that speech. And at least in my case, you know, uh, yes, it would go around to, um, you know, uh, various sets of eyes within uh, your office or, or the department, and uh, but they get sign-offs. You know, usually you didn't have uh, a lot of people trying to put their um, uh, ornament on the Christmas tree. But in a, a type of speech um, like this, uh, which is you know a, a huge speech where you're trying to get in uh, all of these uh, different. Um, you know, uh, uh, mentions of different programs and all that. And it does became, become a huge Christmas tree with lots of ornaments put on there by different people who want you, the speechwriter, to put that ornament on for them. And so it just becomes, uh, you know, a very difficult speech to write because you've got to satisfy all these different kind of constituencies within your own office or administration. Um, you know, I would say, you know, in, in uh, my, uh, you know, evaluation of the speech quality of this particular speech by President Biden uh, is that, yes, you know, it, it, it suffers from that problem, the, the Christmas tree ornament problem. But I also think that, you know, what, what's interesting about that speech in terms of like the quality of it is like the ornaments that were not put on. There was I mean, it, it's like sins of, co of omission. Uh, I mean, you look at the fact that China was not mentioned at all. The, you know, the, the, the huge problem of Taiwan looming on the horizon. If we think that this terrible thing that's going on with Ukraine is uh, awful, well, what's going to happen when uh, and if uh, China does the same thing to Taiwan, uh, which you know, has huge strategic importance to the United States? So, but there was no mention whatsoever about that potential situation or even, you know, any of the things that uh, the China is doing now. I know that the uh, exiled prime minister of the Uyghur uh, people, you know, was ex extremely disappointed that there was no mention about their situation in the speech. Um, also, too, I think with the uh, world and uh, our foreign policy and security position being so uncertain right now, the fact that Biden 
virtually said nothing about like you know improving our military uh, capabilities to uh, you know remain a uh, powerful deterrent against uh, these uh, terrible uh, forces that are out there in the world. Um, you know, and the fact that we need to have modernization, we need to have uh, a credible deterrent. You know, I just thought that there was no talk about that. He's the commander in chief. He needs to be talking about that. And when, you know, I think that, the, and this is my last thing I will say, is that the, the thing that's going to end up killing him, you know, uh, in, or at least uh, uh, tripping him up down the road is the fact that when he said, and, and Roe mentioned this earlier, when he said, we're going to be okay. And he said that twice, we're going to be okay. I don't know if that was, inserted into the speech or that was an ad lib line by president biden but you know you know if if the russians as what appears to be happening right now if they encircle uh, cities such as kiev and if they um you know take over the capital if you have atrocities committees i i you know i pray for that not, those things don't happen but you know god knows what will happen to president zelensky you know if those terrible things come to pass you know, you're going to have that, pictures of that played next to Joe Biden saying, we're going to be OK. And that, to me, is a terrible, uh, uh, you know, sin of speech writing, if that was actually in the speech itself. So, Lance, I think you made a couple of really, really great points. It's almost as if the NSC was shut out of this speech and everyone else, all the various departments had had their little hand on on a two or three lines uh, of the speech. Isn't that something? Other than um, Ukraine, there wasn't anything on foreign policy or from the Pentagon. So yeah, you make a, a really great point. Well, for me, my takeaway was, you know, just his delivery that that he tramples on his natural applause lines with that shaky, unsteady delivery. And of course, he had a few examples of that creepy whisper uh, which I don't know what that's all about, but it's it's very I find that very uh, disturbing, you know. And he he was continually stepping on what what should be great moments in his in his speech, and it, it even trampled on the emotional highlight of the night, which, you know, which was the when he was discussing those burned soldiers, and he introduced the widow who was in the in the chambers. You just also want to tell me, I, I don't know if it's slow down or does he not rehearse much for this? I, I, I don't know. But the delivery really, as always is the case in a Biden speech, de- detracted from it. And then the weird thing at the end, go get him. Who are we going to go get? Is that rhetorical? Go get him. Are we getting Putin? I don't know. Um, is that in the transcript, Tim? You know, they 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 embargo this the speech transcript before it's released. But you had these biz- odd lines like that. Go get him. Where did that come from? Yeah, and and who who are we going going to get? So let's you know, kind of on that point, let's um, maybe um, it, um, talk about if there's um, something else that stood out to you, either in the speech or in the audience reaction. For me, it was. Just Pelosi and Schumer just looked like loons there. Pelosi was weirdly in the background. She didn't know when to stand up. And she was so, I mean, she would have stood up the entire time and applauded everything. And she just looked goofy. Then you had Schumer was jumping up off cue. Eric Swalwell looked like a fool in his blue scarf because he's so desperate, you know, for attention, uh, anybody's attention. So I, I just thought they were just, it, just a bit much. You don't have to be overt cheerleaders uh, like that in the State of the Union speech. You know, I thought the uh, the um, audience was kind of sparse, don't you think? I mean, normally that every inch of the chamber is packed, but I saw some empty seats. W- were they social distancing or were they, they were? Yeah. They were. They there was. Um, they were spread out, so members were even in the gallery. And it was um, they kind of uh, I think the leadership of each side determined who got to be on the floor and who was uh, in the gallery. So, yes, there there was definitely some social distancing or capacity, you know, at play, which is not a good optic when we've 
when we're declaring victory on COVID, we shouldn't have any capacity restrictions. Well, it's also a little goofy, too, because I noticed that the justices were, um, I think they were a seat apart. And gosh, you, you think they do that in the in the Supreme Court? I'm sure they're all in the same room discussing cases. <laughs> Tim, what I would uh, say, the other thing that, that stuck out to me is that, I mean, you know, uh, Biden, and this goes back to his inaugural speech uh, last year, where, you know, he talked about unity, you know, that he was going to somehow be the unity president. Well, it's turned out, you know, if you look at the polling data, that he has been one of the most divisive presidents uh, in modern history. And people think that we uh, are in in a more divisive situation right now in this country uh, than we had ever been. And so, you know, uh, he he rolls out, I think, to address that issue, he rolls out what he calls his unity agenda. And, you know, if you look at this thing again, it's unserious, you know, because if he was really serious about having a unity agenda, he'd talk about some of the big issues that are, you know, uh, stuck in Congress because there's a lot of division about them. And how are we going to how is he going to, you know, do some compromises to get Republicans to you know, come on board so you can have, uh, you know, a, a unified, bi- a truly bipartisan uh, approval of some of these big issues. But instead, what does he put out there as his quote unquote unity agenda? He says we should end cancer. You know, it's like, really? That is your unity agenda is to, you know, put out things like that. You know, he, he, he spent his whole uh, speech talking about, uh, you know, legislative proposals that he wants to get through, uh, but never really talking about how he's going to try and get uh, Republican support or compromise or talk with, uh, you know, the other side uh, across the aisle in order to uh, achieve that unity on, on his agenda. Instead, he rolls out this separate group of uh, issues that he thinks, you know, we should rally around uh, to, uh, you know, achieve unity. And again, it's it's totally laughable. It was tacked. It seemed like it was tacked on. And, uh, you know, and again, just shows how unserious Biden in this administration is when it comes to their even the uh, uh, disingenuousness of their own rhetoric. You know, Lance, um, that that begs the question: you know, who is the real Joe Biden? Is he uh, is he you know a uniter, someone who wanted to bring together the country, and his staff is fighting him all the way? Or, or perhaps he really is this uh, a divisive, very progressive fellow. I mean, that's what that's not what the American people voted for. So, it, you know, the question is, who's really running this show here? And is he in touch enough to know that the proposals um, that he is giving to the American people are not a unifying agenda? Who's running the show here? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good question, Ro. I mean. You know, I think for the American people, when they look at him, they uh, people wonder, is this really, does Joe Biden really believe in some of these things? And certainly has he believed in everything he's done uh, throughout the course of his administration? Does he, I mean, he's put forward, for example, some of the most far left appointments, uh, you know, of any administration in the history of this country. And does he actually believe that? Because we were sold uh, the, uh, from their campaign that he was a, you know, more centrist Democrat. And, uh, you know, instead we get this, you know, uh, basically this uh, administration that, uh, that Obama would fantasize about. You know, is he the one who's really running the show? I can't say, you know, but uh, either way, whether he really believes in this stuff or if there's you know, if he's totally stra- staff driven by a very far left staff, the end result is that we have a very far left agenda, you know, with a very unserious attempt to unify this country and uh, it, with uh, incompetence and policy failures all wrapped up in a nice, horrible bow. So in our final minutes, we should talk about who had probably, you know, the toughest task of the evening, and that was the Republican response by an unusual choice, Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds. Ro, what did you think of, uh, of her response? Did she give an effective pushback to the president? I normally fault the setting and the backdrop of these uh, rebuttals. I thought that the, the backdrop 
of the Iowa State Capitol was was powerful. Um, she gave uh, she hit on all of the right points um, that as a conservative, as a free marketeer, that I want to hear. She pointed out um, uh, the flaws um, of the the administration. Um, I, I think she did a, a perfectly good job for what she had to work with and under the circumstances. Lance, what was your uh, what grade do you give Governor Reynolds? Well, you know, I, 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 it was interesting. And like you and I, Tim, you know, prior to the speeches, you know, we had been talking about, you know, uh, the choice of Governor Reynolds as the Republican respondent. And we were wondering, you know, why did they choose her out of all the people? I mean, the Republicans have a pretty good bench of folks to choose from uh, for the response. And, you know, most people have not heard of Governor Reynolds. And so why did they choose her? Uh, Iowa politically is become, you know, a fairly uh, solid Republican state. And so, you know, it wasn't as if it was definitely a marginal state. So you, you kind of wondered why. But I, I, I will agree with Roe that I thought that maybe because I didn't have a lot of high expectations, because these uh, responses, no matter who gives them, you know, you're usually disappointed. But, um, you know, I maybe partly because of that, but also, too, I thought that, uh, you know, she did, she was, may have been the right person to, uh, uh, to, to go up against Biden, because, I mean, again, to go back to my uh, original point about Biden's disingenuousness, the thing I think you can say about uh, Kim Reynolds is that she does come off as, um, you know, simple. You know, her delivery was simple. It was sincere. And you felt that she was authentic. And so I think that that authenticity plays well, uh, you know, against uh, Biden's disingenuousness. And, you know, yes, she's not a foreign policy expert, but I think, you know, she did uh, deliver the right lines. I did think that the, you know, uh, one of the best lines that she delivered uh, throughout her response was uh, the emphasis on parents. She said that parents matter. And I think that uh, that was a huge point in this speech because Biden really didn't address education really and from the point of view of the parents. And, uh, you know, which was a huge uh, miss for uh, Biden because it was the parents who threw out the Democrats in Virginia. And, uh, you know, he didn't really uh, address that. And I think that uh, at least their concerns. And so uh, the fact that Reynolds focused on this pro-parent revolution that's going on across the country and that parents matter, I think that would resonate a lot, uh, you know, uh, in many homes uh, in, in this country, not just in Iowa or the Midwest, but as we've seen, you know, in San Francisco, in Virginia and other places, you know, it's something that is a countrywide phenomenon. And it's not just, you know, something that is in the conservative heartland. Well, I don't know what speech you two were watching, but I thought it stunk. She did. I will give her credit. The themes about listening to the concerns of real Americans was a good contrast with Biden's speech. And I thought she had a very good explanation of what Build Back Better means, tax breaks for millionaires in California and New York. But I thought it was a horribly delivered speech. Like Biden, she was just racing through the speech. There was no pause for effect or, or, or change in tone to emphasize a point. I thought she had a very uh, dour look on her face. I, I didn't see her as sincere at all. I thought her so I was reading the teleprompter in a very emotionless way, in a way that she didn't really identify um, with anyone. She was just reading a paper. You know, I didn't find her sincere at all. And actually, I, I found myself thinking, imagine how more effective this speech would have been if a politician with actual charisma and speech making ability delivered the speech. Um, Ro, I disagree on the Capitol. I thought it was a very cold setting to have her in the dark. You know, that, that doesn't give across a kind of a optimistic look for the future, though I get they were going for, you know, we're outside of Washington. And I also thought the, the, the big failing was it really shortchanged Ukraine. It was like the speech was set in stone and not really updated for the events of the day. You know, where was where was the, any talk of solidarity with Ukraine? Where was the forceful rhetoric about 
defending freedom and turning back attacks on our um, democracy. You know, I, I, I think that while there were some good lines, it read like the bid on Ukraine was just added at the last minute, just just kind of kind of an add on. Uh, I really thought, which was my my thought going into this, I think it was a lost opportunity to meet the moment. You know, I I think they should have had a, you know, potentially a foreign policy leader give some or or, or, or all of the response, like, say, Senator Tom Cotton or the great um, Ukrainian Republican congresswoman who who spoke so eloquently yesterday. Um, so, yes, I thought it was a very uh, ineffective uh, response and kind of missed the moment. Well, I think that uh, it's so great that all of that the three of between the three of us, uh, we have and you know given our professional backgrounds that we have you know such different points of view on a particular speech. And I think that that uh, you know uh, just goes to show you that even among speech writers, you know, uh, you know who have a lot of experience, that you know we can have very different opinions. <laughs> and we, the three of us probably gave more scrutiny to Kim Reynolds' speech than anybody else in America has today. (laughs) That's probably true. (laughs) Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. You know, we stayed up late for you, so we hope you enjoy our panel. Thanks so much. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.